like a shepherd. You know me by name. You lead me by still waters. Your love will never change. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He has been raised. Remember what you said when he was still in Galilee? That the human one must be handed over to the sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, and, and the mother of James. Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense and they didn't believe the woman. But Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, he saw only a linen cloth. Then he returned home wondering what had happened. Amen to the reading of the resurrection story. So do you know the answer to this fill in the blank question? South Lincoln residents on average live blank years longer than North Lincoln residents. Now I'm gonna tell you that answer in a minute. But before then, it is Easter. Now we celebrate Holy Week, we celebrate Easter year after year because it's crucial that we don't cut to the end, that we don't just cut to what happens after death. And here is a funny example for you. It's from a movie called Wanderlust. It's a 2012 film starring Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston. Basically, the film is this. There is a couple, and they're trying to find like the purpose of, of life, their, their meaning of life. And so they stumble upon this commune. Now, this commune, they live together, they work off the land, they share everything. And so the couple decides to join uh, this commune, to live there with the others. Now, George, though, he's like a little reluctant to go fully into the experience. Well, someone takes George's car, which now they all share, right? And, and somebody takes the car into town, and it ends up in a pond, now here's the scene, George and Rodney, who took the car into town, they're standing at the pond looking at the car that's submerged it into the water. And George says, what happened? And Rodney said, I took our car over to town, came back around the back road, and boom, cut to in the pond. And George is like, okay, but what exactly happened? And Rodney said, I took our car to town. I came back, boom, cut to in the pond. And George is like, no, don't cut to in the pond. Don't cut. And Rodney responds with, 
I'm with you, man. No, no, Rodney wasn't with him. Rodney did not get that George wanted the details. Like, he wanted to know how they got to where they were. Do you ever ask that question? Like, how did we get where we are? I wonder how in the world did we get to a place where in one community within miles in between, the average life expectancy of two different areas of the same town varies by 15 years. That's the answer to that fill-in-the-blank question. South Lincoln residents, on average, live 15 years longer than many of our North Lincoln communities. This statistic comes from a collaboration with Place Matters, Place Matters is a national initiative designed to help communities understand and identify and address social and economic and environmental factors that go into health inequities. And also a collaboration with the Community Health Endowment of Lincoln, whose vision statement is to make Lincoln the healthiest city in the nation. Now, when I first heard this troubling statistic, I went home, similar to Peter, after seeing the empty tomb, wondering what had happened and who's going to do something about it. So today, on this Resurrection Sunday, where we know most of the details of Jesus' life and Jesus' death and the resurrection, we ask the question, do we live like resurrection people. Now, I want to do a thought experiment with you this morning, and I want us to imagine just for a bit that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that the women went to the tomb, maybe they found it full, maybe they did find it empty, and and they told the others, and Peter came and found it empty, but he had all these other explanations of why this happened. Maybe Jesus didn't die fully on the cross, maybe he was still alive, maybe thieves came to take and stole the body. But it concerns me, and it should concern you, that for many of us who call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus, we are living our lives as if Jesus is no more than a good, perfect role model. A role model who showed love and forgiveness and compassion and kindness, who reached out to the poor and the women and the children and the marginalized, He lived his life as a great role model and then died. Now, every single other major major religion recognizes Jesus as a significant person in history. Some recognize Jesus as a prophet, others uh, just a really good person who did good things, and everyone as, as recognized Jesus as someone who caused waves, who changed the world. Jesus taught love and peace instead of war and hate, but God's people were looking for a savior, not a role model. Hosanna was shouted in the streets of Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, marking the beginning of Jesus' final week before his death. Now, Hosanna means save us. But if the resurrection didn't happen, there's no hallelujah, there's no praise God for what you have done for us. We'd all still be shouting to God, save us. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the hopes of the disciples would have been shattered The teachings of Jesus may have been lost in time. Death would have remained undefeated. It's shadow casting this despair over all of humanity. And our sins, we would be carrying around those sins like burdens with no assurance of redemption, no chance of reconciliation. A few months ago, on my way to my ordination interview, I I had this three-hour drive, 
And generally, when I drive any amount of distance, I listen to podcasts. I listen to New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, crime junkies, uh, Bishop Robert, Robert Barron's Sunday morning sermons, and a bunch of plant-based eating podcasts. But I thought, okay, for this drive, I thought that it was more important to have music on to help calm some of my anxieties as I was going to this really big interview. So I turned on worship music. I have a playlist that mainly plays songs that we sing here on Sunday morning. But at some point in the drive, I changed the music from worship music to musicals. Now, I questioned my decision. I was like, what good are these songs going to do for me in my interview? So I got to my interview, and one of my interview teams asked me, Mandy, how would you explain salvation to an eighth grader? And who knew that it would be a song from a musical that would come to my head to help me answer that question more than any other worship song that I had listened to. So the song that I had listened to and that came into my head was the song Unredeemable from the movie Spirited. Now here are some of the lyrics. Am I forever unredeemable? Can I ever overcome all the wrongs I'm running from? Can my worst be left behind? And do I deserve to find there's a soul who could see any good in me? Or will I only ever be unredeemable? And so I answered this question, mentioning that I had just listened to this song. And I said, you know, this is, this is it. If I'm going to be talking to an eighth grader or an adult... I'm going to say something like, life sometimes makes us feel that we are unredeemable, that we will never be enough, that we will never live up to our perfect role model of Jesus. Life teaches us sometimes that we don't deserve it because of the things that we've done or the things that we haven't done. And because we often feel like we'll never measure up, Jesus becomes part of the answer of salvation. If Jesus didn't save us, then we rely on ourselves or other things in this world to save us, and it's probably not going to end well. We'll just continue to swim in this idea of, of I'm not good enough or I don't deserve it, or I am unredeemable. And this is kind of the world that we live in. And, and then when we're not pointing and saying those things to ourselves, then we start pointing to other people, and we start saying it to them. Well, uh, those people committed crimes, or those people are, are living a, a lifestyle that I judge as detestable. And so, so you're not deserving, and you're unworthy. But Jesus tells us to not live by the rules of this world. Now, another song that was introduced to me recently was a song. Uh, my husband and I were taking a road trip, and he's, and he's like, Hey, have you ever heard of Jelly Roll? And I was like, like the pastry? And he's like, no, the artist. And I said, no. And he said, well, he's a hip-hop rapper turned country musician. I, I don't know. And then, and then my husband was like, well, he has this song called Save Me. I want you to listen to it. So here are some of the lyrics to this song. Somebody save me, me from myself. I've spent so long living in hell. They say my lifestyle is bad for my health. It's the only thing that seems to help. All of this drinking and smoking is hopeless, but feel like it's all that I need. Something inside of me's broken. I hold on to anything that sets me free. I'm a lost cause. Baby, don't waste your time on me. I'm so damaged beyond repair. Life has shattered my hopes and my dreams. Now, these lyrics of these songs mimic what many people think. 
searching for something to save them, searching for hope in what seems like a hopeless world. And too, too often people give up on life because it's hard and it's complicated and sometimes it's really painful. And so we drink or we smoke or we gamble or we shop or we look at porn or we do other things that waste our times that, that are unhealthy for us, but we feel like these things might repair us. We feel like these things might save us only to find out these things don't last. Those things die, and they remain stuck in the tomb of our heart, full of pain and hurt and sadness. So if the resurrection didn't happen, and, and all we have is Jesus as a good role model to follow after, we're gonna feel defeated and hopeless and inadequate to follow in those footsteps. It's easy sometimes, though, to live in that space as Jesus is a good role model because there's a lot of things that we don't understand, a lot of things that we can't explain fully. I mean, even the scriptures are inconsistent of what happened that morning. How, which women were at the tomb and who arrived first? And what did they see when they arrived? Was it two men standing there in dazzling white clothes as we heard today? Or the other gospel versions where it was a young man in a white robe on the right side? Or was it an angel sitting on the stone that had been rolled away? There are many, many discrepancies in scriptures, but for thousands of years, in all of written and oral accounts, the tomb is always empty. For many people, though, they want proof. Okay, if the tomb is, is empty... If I'm going to believe that God really did raise Jesus from the dead and there's no other explanation for it, like give me some proof. Now for me, the proof is in the disciples' actions. In the days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, his followers, like his best friends, those who were there who witnessed all of his miracles, what were they doing? They betrayed him, they denied him, they hid in a room because they were scared to die. And then three days later, when the tomb was found empty, they began to unravel the good news of Jesus. And they saw Jesus, and they ate with Jesus, and they, they touched his scars. And then they didn't hide anymore. This news was so great that they were willing to go into the streets proclaiming the good news of Jesus, saying, kill us if you must, but we have to tell you what we saw. And they indeed were killed because they shared with others what they experienced. I don't get it. I don't get how it can happen, but I believe in a God who created the universe where atoms and molecules and things come together to form things like humans that think and feel and create, much like the creator itself. Or I don't get how the moon and the earth and their, their tilt and the rotations are just exactly right, and if it was just a little bit off, then we couldn't exist. I don't get how Jesus could be dead and then alive, but I believe in a God who can make all things possible. And if the disciples believed enough to be willing to be put to death, they must not have faced the same fears anymore. Before the resurrection, they hid, they feared death. But after, there was hope. And hope defeats all things, including death. They went from Hosanna of save us to hallelujah, he is the one who sets us free. 
Every Sunday that we gather together, we, we celebrate these mini resurrection or little Easter Sundays because we celebrate this wonder every single week, the wonder that God has done. The Apostle Paul has these words to the church to help people live as resurrection people. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering around in the dark as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ in resurrection because they're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is, is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the ceremonies, the, the cemeteries. What good is the resurrection if we just go on living our normal lives? What good is the resurrection if we don't change how we live, how we treat one another, how we share the good news? And as a church that sits in South Lincoln, what will we do about the disparities in our town, about the injustices, about the hopelessness that exist here in Lincoln? What will we do about the 15-year life expectancy difference? Now, when we celebrate Christmas, Christmas brings anticipation of hope of the world in, in a baby boy, right? That's, that's the Christmas hope. But Easter is hope in a different way. Easter is hope in a movement, a movement of Christians to recognize that others might be experiencing Good Friday darkness and they don't see that Sunday is coming. They don't know what's at the end. And so when we bring this hope to the world, we bring that hope for them. And the Bible teaches us how to do it. Even the, the prophets in the Old Testament teach us how to do it. They have something, they had something to say then, and they have something to say to us now about the suffering and the injustices that are happening in our world and what God's people are called to do about it. A resurrection mindset is powerful because it sees pain, it sees suffering and injustice and laments in it, and then it focuses on God's restoration plan and Jesus' ultimate eternal victory over life, and then it takes action. So do you believe that there's good in the world? Do you uh, want to be a part of that good, and do you want others to have that same opportunity. When our hearts break for others and we are willing to give our lives like the disciples, to share the good news, that's when we begin to act as resurrection people. We, we live as resurrection people when we actively participate in God's mission giving our tithes and offerings, serving, praying, visiting the, the prisoners or those who are sick as Jesus commanded us to do. And, and when we desire to share that hope with others who are going through darkness, even our enemies, we live as if the resurrection is real. There is a lot of passion here at Horizons for, for helping others. People are passionate about helping kids in India eat, have a safe place to stay, and, and learn about Jesus through our Pro Project Hope ministry. I love that we have people here, so many people here, passionate about justice work who are trying to make changes in our county to, to give more people access to mental health services, 
to give more people access to affordable housing and, and to give people a second chance who may have made a mistake, uh, allowing for them to become po uh, productive, positive members of our community, to have hope. I love that we partner with the Food Bank of Lincoln and their backpack program. Like all of these things and more things that we are doing are actions. These are the things, these are the things that we are doing to actively participate in God's mission. These are the things that we are do doing to be living like Christ in our world, living as resurrection people. I mentioned earlier that the Community Endowment of Lincoln, their vision statement is to make Lincoln the healthiest city in the nation. I love that vision statement. It is a bold vision statement. And for many of you know, we've been spending the last year or so uh, developing our mission and our values, and we don't quite yet have a bold vision statement, but we're working on it. There is a team of people who are talking to people within our church and outside of our church trying to figure out where we are called to go in the future. And we're going to be rolling this vision statement out soon. And with the vision statement, there are going to be strategies and action steps. It's so that we can make sure that we are actively participating in God's mission. If we live like Jesus is just a great man of the past whose life should be studied and his words should be followed, and now he is dead, we leave him in the past. We leave Jesus in the tomb. But the tomb is empty, and Jesus is alive, which means the future holds something pretty incredible. But we're not going to cut to the end just yet. We're not going to just say, well, I believe in Jesus and I'm going to have eternal life. Because if we do that, there's a whole lot of life that we're missing out on. And when we take those actions, more songs might end with hope rather than despair. Songs won't end with, am I unredeemable, or I'm so damaged beyond repair, life has shattered my hopes and dreams. But rather, the songs of life will end with, I am redeemable because of the empty tomb. I'm not damaged beyond repair. I have hope for myself because Jesus is alive, and I will have that same hope for others too. God's hope for us in the empty tomb is that we live as resurrection people today and forevermore. Amen? Would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, on this Easter morning, we come before you with our hearts filled with gratitude for the empty tomb and the promise of resurrection. Help us to embrace the journey of faith, not, not skipping to the end, but instead cherishing every single detail. May we live as resurrection people, sharing the hope and the redemption found in Christ's victory over death with people who are walking in darkness who may not know that Sunday is coming. Empower us to confront injustice, to lament suffering, and to work for the well-being of all. And may our actions reflect the transformative power of your love. And we say all of this in the name of the risen Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.